man. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on. Who's the man? What's happening? How y'all doing tonight? We want to say hello to all our campuses, San Ysidro, San Marcos, City Heights, East County, Donovan State Prison, and Juvenile Hall. Let's give all those people out there a big hand. God bless y'all. How's everybody doing? How many of y'all here for the first time? Raise your hand. Okay, five people. <laughs> welcome, 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 welcome. That's a good thing, that's a good thing. Uh, before we start, let me just uh, introduce myself. I'm Pastor Miles of the Rock, and welcome to church. Amen. It's good to have y'all here tonight. Um, a few housekeeping things as we, I know we have Philip Rivers all excited and stuff, but we just want to do a little church business before we start. Can I get amen? Amen. Uh, and we're going to do some church business after I get done and either as well. Uh, we had a family uh, in our San Ysidro campus um, lose their baby, uh, Stephen and Christina uh, McDonald, lost their baby, was born Wednesday, passed away yesterday. And so we just want to lift them up in prayer. We want to say uh, God bless you to them, praying for you and your family, and also the San Ysidro campus that has come around them and loved on them. Um, church is about family, and it's about taking care of each other, and it's about spreading the gospel, but we got to take care of our own, so God bless y'all out there, and let's give them a hand. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we also want to lift up prayer. We had uh, 20 of our staff uh, transition off our staff this week. We want to keep them in prayer. They were great people, serve God faithfully, and we keep their families in prayer as they're going to be transitioning to new jobs as well. Amen? Let's get on our knees. Let's get on our knees. Um, if you are new, what we're going to do is pray. And my prayer is that God would pr prepare your heart for what's going to be said. Um, that the Holy Spirit would speak to you about your life and about you drawing closer to Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for um, just being God. Thank you that none of us have that job or responsibility. Thank you that when things are going wrong in our life and things are falling apart, we could always come to you. And I pray tonight people would make a decision that Jesus Christ is who they need to trust with their life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am so excited. Um, Philip doesn't really need an introduction because he's been with us in this city for a long time. Amen. But I was asking him, what would you want me to say? He's like, I don't know. But I, I'll just give you a few highlights. He's been here 14 years. He's been to the Pro Bowl five, six times. He didn't even know how many times he's been to the Pro Bowl, which is pretty interesting and, and humble. But uh, the one thing he said is two things that you could say. I was a team captain, which was a big deal to me. And uh, ever since his first start, he's never missed a game. He is third on the list of consecutive game quarterbacks, Favre, Eli, and Phillip Rivers for never missing a game. So listen, can we all give a rock church welcome to Phillip Rivers? Amen. I don't see anybody out there with my jersey on. How come the hell? It's like. <laughs> that was a long time ago, Mom. <laughs> I don't know. If, what year were you born? 81. Oh, yeah. 81. <laughs> you were born in 81? I came here in 82. You were one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's a trip. So, so I told him when he was coming, I said, here's what we're going to talk about. And I said, your wardrobe, because I was hoping you were going to wear one of those bolo ties. What, what, tell me about that. Well, I, it was a little bit of a uh, boycott to the dress code. Um, ah. co when, when Norv left and Coach McCoy came in, uh, you know, it was, just, it was just church attire. It was slacks and a shirt like this. Church attire? Yeah. Uh, church attire? Church attire. This is what we wear at church, so we're good. We're, we're in good shape. <laughs> we were in good shape here. And, and uh, Coach McCoy said everybody's wearing a coat and tie. 
And so I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show him. I'm going to find a bolo tie. Oh. So it, 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 fit. it was a tie. So, so it, was a, it was a tie. It counted. So you were kind of uh, um, modeling to the younger generation to, re- to resist <laughs> authorities. I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's kind of, hold on. <laughs> it, was, it was all did in they, fun. Did they say anything to you? No, no. It was a tie. Code and tie. And, that, and I, don't really, I don't really like them that much, but then it started. Neither did we. <laughs> it turned into something. I, I never owned one in my life until that day. So. No, we, we, did anybody not like the bolo tie? Does anybody know, even know what we're talking about? <laughs> it was like a little string, like a little, a little ro- a roach rope. thing. And then just a, string, a rope. And a rope. Yeah. Did you have it already? No, I went, and, I went to Boot Barn and bought a, bought a handful. Of so I see you got cowboy boots that look really worn. Oh, yeah. They're like slippers. Like slippers at this point. Do you, do you ride? Do you do? No, nah, I'm just country. <laughs> <laughs> and your belt buckle. Yeah. Cross, got the cross yeah. on the belt buckle. Sh- show them your belt buckle. Show them your belt buckle. <laughs> it's, it's not, not too big. Not too big. So listen, before we start, I want to read something. Everyone get your Bible. As a matter of fact, let's, uh, let's um, baptize Philip on our word. Amen. Are you all ready? Uh, we're going to lift up our Bible and say word. One, two, three. Let's see your Bible. Say word. Yeah. One more time. Who wasn't ready? Let's say one more time. Say word. Yeah. See all the millennials out there with little phones. They, 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 don't, they don't carry Bibles anymore. <laughs> they carry apps. <laughs> Turn to 1 uh, Samuel. We're going to read a passage from David and Goliath real quick. That's going to set the tone for what we're going to talk about. Um, this morning, we talked about stepping into our fear. That often we have situations in our life that are scary to step into. And we pray that God would take our situations away. And often he says, I'm not going to remove the negative situation. I'm going to strengthen you to attack it. Are you all following me? All you all got something going on in your life, you always will to the day you die. As a matter of fact, death will be your biggest challenge. But he wants you to trust him and step into it. He doesn't want you to run away from it. He's not necessarily going to remove it to make your life easy. Even though we think in our mind that life is supposed to be easy, we're supposed to be obedient. And so David was going to fight Goliath. And what David did is what I'm going to challenge all of you to do. Proclaim the victory of God that he has done in your life already because God has done amazing things in all your life. And then also proclaim his promises, what he did in the past, what he's going to do in the future. You tell the devil you're wrong, God is faithful in my life. So let's read this real quick. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 34, David is going to fight Goliath. And he is going to say what God has done for him, and he's going to say what God's going to do for him. It says in verse 34, David said, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and struck it and killed it. K-I-L-T, kilt. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Then look at verse 37. David said, the Lord who delivered me. Everybody say, who delivered me. Past tense. The Lord who delivered me from the, um, the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will future deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Everyone say, uh, the Lord who delivered me, he will deliver me. Very good. I want you to keep that in mind as we talk. And I want you to be thinking about one thing you're dealing with. Because we're not just here to interview Philip. We're here to talk about God in our lives. Amen. And what, he, what you're dealing with, and I want you to remember what he's done in your life, which is amazing. And that, that promise is going to get you through the future. Amen? Okay, now let's talk. Okay, the big, big, big issue is the charges are leaving. Everybody's mad. Amen? Yeah. We're not going to take that on on you. <laughs> but I can tell you, in the last few weeks, I'm like, hey, we're going to have Philip. We're going to have some charges. We had some charges yesterday. And it was just quiet. Like, they're not our team anymore. And I was like, dang, it, it hurt me. But we, we love him, right? Yeah. That's still kind of weak, but we'll give you another opportunity in a few minutes. <laughs> tell us, tell us you, your thoughts and how you process that. Well, I think uh, in a different scale, uh, no, no, lions, uh, no lions coming after me. But um, just like that, you know, uh, 
God's victory to this point and his promises in the future. So at first, I think you go through that natural progression of, of sadness, uh, of, about having to leave a place that I've called home for 13 years and um, a community and a, a city that you feel close to, uh, to move to the unknown, you know, up right up the road. And, and certainly adding to that for me is from a small town in, in North Alabama, coming to California was a big deal in itself. I was like, well, I, I didn't really know where exactly San Diego was on the map. I'd never been west of the Mississippi before. <laughs> Does anybody know where Mississippi is? <laughs> and then I don't know where Mississippi and is. And then now you're sending you're sending this old uh, country boy up to Los Angeles. So, but it's uh, it's that natural progression. I've warmed up to it. Uh, you start to get excited about it because it's 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 happening. It's going to be here, and that's the only way I know is is to attack it, attack it head on, and. Uh, make the best of it. And, and so I, I, I understand everyone's disappointment here, but as a leader of the team and as the quarterback, you gotta, uh, you got to go and be fired up about it and embrace it and, and hopefully have a great year. Tell us about, let's, let's go back to your family, not the one you have now. We'll get to that, the growing up family, Alabama, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I, I was an only child uh, until I was 11. Uh, I grew up in a, in a strong uh, Catholic home. Um, where Jesus was the center, of, the center of our life and center of my life, all from being a little boy. I was an altar boy and, and uh, grew up as an only child until I was 11. Little brother came along when I was 11, and then a sister came along when I was 16. So I'm the, I, I have a younger brother and sister, which have, uh, have been awesome. We're close, closer now than we were when I was there because they were so much younger than, than I was. But um, <clears throat> my faith has always been very important to me. Uh, but I think going, when I went to college is when it really became my own. Um, you know, there was no more mom and dad uh, waking you up on Sunday morning and saying, let's go. It was truly, I had to get up out of that dorm room and, and, and go to church, go to mass that Sunday. And um, so that's when I, when I really took ownership of my faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'm very thankful for the, the upbringing I had. You know, I'm thankful for mom and dad. And, and the one message they gave me was, uh, you don't miss. You don't miss on Sunday. Among other things, that was drilled mm -hmm. home to me mm -hmm. and um, very well because uh, I certainly got, got my rear end up every, every Sunday morning when I was up in Raleigh. And now you have eight, eight kids. Yeah. You understand how this is happening. <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm so thankful. My family, my wife, I met actually in middle school. Um, uh, she, uh, it, it, you know, I remember telling my mom, you know, small town, Alabama, so, you know, you, the little league fields is kind of the place to be, you know, on a Saturday afternoon or a Tuesday night during baseball season. And uh, I remember pointing her out to my mom. And in even middle at, school? In middle school. Uh, I was 13 or 14. And she was a, she's a strong Christian woman. She, she still is. And her faith was, she wasn't a woman at that point, but her faith was very <laughs> strong then. And that was important well, to me, even, even at a young age. And I remember, I remember exactly the conversation. I pointed her out to my mom from across the way and said, hey, mom, you see that girl over there? She's a good girl. And it uh, wasn't too many years later. I was 19, 19, and we were married. So, and 16 years now and eight children later, so. It was meant wow. to be. So when you were 13, 14, in middle school is usually like 12, so you were a little behind. But anyway, that's okay. But uh, <laughs> I was just thinking in my head. But it's, it's probably Alabama thing, right? Alabama. Okay, I got you. Uh, I'm just trying to put the pieces together. Um, when you said, Mom, that's a good girl over there, did how soon after that did you meet her, or had you already known her? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember the exact timeline, oh, but you don't remember asking her out. Yeah, no, it was like y'all went down to the lake and kind of threw rocks and things. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that uh, that good of a story. Okay, but yeah, so our, our, I have six girls and two boys, and uh, my oldest actually just finished eighth grade, so I'm getting into the high school years now. The, the three girls are oldest, and then boy, uh, girl, boy, girl, girl. So, um, yeah, my, my boys are nine and five. And I want to go back to your wife, everywhere though, in before between. you skip that, kind of jumped out of that. I, I still want to talk about, did y'all, how long did y'all date? Like, well, like, when did you, like, you got married at 19, so how long were y'all an item? Yeah, well, um, you know, 
remaining pure, being chaste was very important to us. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be many other reasons to get married at 19 at that point. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a penny to my name. So, <laughs> that was good. That was good. I was thinking it, but I didn't want to well, say it. Know, I was thinking it. I wasn't like it. I had it all together at 19. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. Hey, yeah, I know what's that, going on that now. scholarship check wasn't going yeah. very far. <laughs> but so, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I used all my umpiring money and my grass mowing money to, to buy a ring, and that wiped out the whatever account I did have at that point. And that did not come from Zales. And that did, no, no, no. Um, so, yeah, and then, and then I, but I think that time for us was very uh, big, uh, both in our marriage and in our faith journey because, you know, we, shoot, we were in a little apartment and making it work. You know, she was working at a daycare, and I was a sophomore in college playing football, and my folks lived in town. We ended up living with them in the basement for some time. And so that was a very, uh, a lot of growth came from that. Yeah. And um, so we're thankful for those times, and, certainly. And let me say this, do not get married just so you can have sex. <laughs> we're not saying that. However, if you know that's who you're going to marry, you do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? Just be careful that you put the right thing first. Like when I met my wife, we dated, and we were not Christian for four years, and we were a mess, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when I got saved, I said, you know, I knew I was going to marry her from the first time I saw my wife. I told my friend, I'm going to marry that girl. I hadn't met her yet. And so we dated, and it was a mess. But when I got saved, I said, we're gonna, now we're going to get married. We're not going to have sex till we get married. And we got engaged and married in 11 days. So don't get married just so you can have sex. <laughs> that's now, not what I was saying either. I'm not saying that's what you were saying. I'm just trying, I'm just trying to make sure they I'm are here. You were thinking 19? What in the <laughs> yeah, world? Uh, yeah, I, but, but I'm just saying that. That played it, a part. My, you know, I, I had history. He had history worked out. But, you know, marriage is not a thing to play around with. And then having kids is not a play, thing to play around with. Eight I, kids, Absolutely man. not. And I think that the, the center of that was our foundation of our relationship right. was was on Jesus. Right. There so you go. that that is why that yeah, is why yeah, it's yeah, worth this point. Pain. Pain. Um, dealing with difficult things. Um, trial. You know, people people see celebrities and they think everything's fine. They don't know the backstory. And and, and even when they see something happen on TV, they don't know what's going on in here and in here. Talk about the um, uh, the fumble. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, um, shoot, I don't know. Many of y'all may remember it. I'm still sick about it a little bit. But uh, 2012, I think, at Kansas City, Monday night, we're trying to run out the game to win. And uh, me and Hardwick, which we, we never did, fumbled the snap. Hardwick is the center. And so oh, yeah, oh, don't. Um, it was rough because it wasn't an interception, which – I've thrown plenty of. It wasn't one of those where you could explain the story of what happened. It was, I don't know what happened. It's, it's embarrassing, miserable, and you've lost the game, and you really have no explanation for it. But from that um, really came, for me, uh, great growth in my faith. Um, I want to share one thing here. Uh, this is just a little devotion book that's got prayers and devotionals and different things in it. But from that... Uh, really was, I felt a real spiritual attack um, from the, you know, all, all, you know, along the lines of, you know, it's going to happen again. You know, you're going to fumble it again. You're going to lose another game. You're going to, you know, you're not this, that, you know, all those things that you start, that start creeping in your mind whenever you face a struggle or whenever. So then worry took over. I mean, I couldn't get through the week without thinking, you know, it was consuming me, you know, going back to that play of how did it happen? You know, slow mowing it, not this and that, what you know, to, how am I going to prevent this? It took over my whole piece. And, the, and let me, for all y'all who might not have missed it, it, it was in a game and he was getting ready to get the snap and the ball came up and he dropped it and lost, and the other team got the ball and they lost the game. So it was the guy was snapping it to him and that, it wasn't a, an interception he threw. It was, he just dropped the snap, which is supposed to be automatic. Right, right. So 
this is here, I highlighted and read it over and over and over. And it wasn't just about the snap, but then it became about anything. Anything that any of you may be worrying about or have anxiety about. This, this really helped, helped me uh, because too often times in this fast-paced world, we're always thinking about what's tomorrow, what's next week, what's next Sunday. And so let me share this with you uh, real quick. Uh, uh, what does exi- anxiety about the future bring you but only sorrow upon sorrow? Sufficient for the day is the evil thereof. It is vain and useless to conceive either grief or joy for future things, which perhaps shall never come to pass. But it's the nature of man to be deluded with such imaginations. It is the sign of a soul as yet weak to be so easily drawn away by the suggestions of the enemy. For he cares not whether it be with things true or false that he abuses or deceives you whether he overthrow you with the love of things present or the fear of things to come. Uh, believe in me and trust in my mercy. Believe in Jesus, believe in God and trust in my mercy. So that uh, was powerful for me over and over and over to where you go, yeah, why am I going to worry about something that may not even happen and that you know God's grace will meet you there if it does happen uh, to, mm-hmm. to get you through it. So right. that was strong for me and it still is uh, in anything uh, that may come up, you know, and along those lines, we had a coach that used to always tell us, hey, if we, and you could say it in this room right here, let's pop, let's throw all our problems up here, all our burdens, anything we're dealing with, let's throw them up here in a big pile, and we can all see them, and uh, you probably just say, I'll just have mine back, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, because you always think, well, they don't know, they're not dealing with this, or he doesn't know, yeah. he's got it made, or this, 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 but then when it comes down to it, you go, I think I'll just... Keep I just keep mine. Yeah, yeah. I think I just keep my own. Yeah, this family lost their baby when uh, son, yesterday, newborn. I don't know what your problem is. Just trust me. We all have our seasons where we have the thing that's going to destroy us. But there's always probably three million people who have, or maybe a billion people who have more problems than you. Matter of fact, there's 20 million starving in Africa right now. They're going to die because of no food. That's just one crisis. Right? Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean you don't have a problem, but it means put it in perspective. And, and that passage is, is built on this, this verse of Jesus, two verses Jesus said in Matthew 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, whatever you need. Not what you want, what you need. And then it says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Today, so today. And, and when you're faced with stuff that you always will be, because the devil has a way of getting in our head and making us worry about stuff, what has God done in your life if you can think about all the victory, all the time y'all were driving home drunk and you didn't know how you got home? All you girls who are walking through a, through a dark parking structure and God got you to your car safe, amen, because that's like the most dangerous place on the planet to me. Is that God got to gets us through, and we got to say thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you. God. Can I get an amen? And so this, how did you get through that? Because you, you got to go back to work tomorrow. I think it was just that. It was it was meeting it head on, and uh, trusting in God that that you know whatever does happen, if it did happen the very next Sunday, He was going to get me through it. And uh, I think ultimately that's what. That's what it came down to was me surrendering. Yeah, yeah. And it's in humility. You know, we all, we think we can get all, we have all the answers. You type it in on Google and just get the answer. What, what, how do you, is it? But it's really that humility and, and humility and obedience that, um, you know, that God delivers, the Holy Spirit works, and, you know, the Holy Spirit is alive. You know, I, um, it's sa- the same Holy Spirit that impregnated Virgin Mary, the yeah. same Holy Spirit given to the apostles, it's not yeah. running out of steam. Right, right, right. You know? And it's here, and it's real. You know, you know, people always say, just go with your gut. You know, to me, I think that is your, that's your gut, you know. That's what, that's what they're saying. Or it was a coincidence. I ran into him at the store. It wasn't a coincidence. If something great right, came right, from right. it. You know, I had a, our garbage disposal got something in it, and it wasn't working. And whew, talk about eight children and dishes and food and stuff. We got to get that fixed in a hurry. It was nasty. So I do go to Google, type in garbage disposal. And I just call the first one that pops up, and I mean, it wasn't an hour later. The gentleman was there and fixed it, and it was nothing. It took him, you know, it took him five minutes. He was minutes. from the Rock Church. It took him five minutes. He may have been, but he's so, so he, he comes in. I guess not. He does the work. 
he's leaving. We're having a conversation, and he says, uh, he got a little teary-eyed, and he said, you know, and I was pulling in here. I said that if I got to meet you, I was going back to church. And I, and I, I thought, you know, yeah, praise God. You know, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, but the timing of all those phone numbers on that list, you know, and we had a great conversation, and, it get, you know, that gives me the chills thinking watch, about watch that this, watch interaction. This. There's, there's, how, is that guy here? I was waiting for 20 guys to say, yeah, I'm that guy, I'm that guy, I'm that guy. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I want to go back to football, then I'm going to come back to this thing because it just clicked on me. I'm a defensive back. We intercept y'all. But I never had a chance to ask, because you've thrown a few. I, I've never had a chance to ask a quarterback how it feels when we do that to you. <laughs> well, it's, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it doesn't feel good. All of our guys, you know, in practice, that's what, you know, we're going out to the practice field or we're starting a new, you know, period against the defense. And those guys holler over, Casey Hayward or Verrett or one of the linebackers, hey, throw me one. Throw me one today, you know, so it's all fun. And, and you say? No, I can handle it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to stay away from you today. Those, are, those in practice don't, don't feel nerves bad. Those don't count. So Once on Sunday count. So, so, so how does it feel? Yeah. Bad. I want to know. I really want to know. Well, I'm telling you, bad. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that. You got to move on to the next play. You know, you know what amazes me about quarterbacks? To me, how y'all, and you're a big guy. What do you weigh, 240? 30. 230? Um, guys don't get insulted when you overestimate. <laughs> Women are like, <laughs> I look fat. <laughs> guys want to be heavy, right? So anyway, 230. How you guys withstand subs or these dudes that are weigh 280 and can run faster than, way faster than you. Because that's, I mean, you know, that, again, that's not a big deal, right? I mean, you, you, you know, it's, you, you, that's, not your, that's not your role, your game. And endure those, those hits. That, that's the thing, because you've withstood a lot of pain. Yeah, well, that, um, yeah, some of them that look, the worst, look real bad aren't real bad. And then some of them that you go, oh, I wasn't too bad. They catch you in just the right spot, just where that rib protector's yeah. not, or yeah, yeah. just in, the, in the, a, a tough spot. But I tell you, there's nothing really more gratifying on the football field than really taking a big hit laying down and seeing the touchdown, you know, those are the best. Cause uh, then they're, they're laying on you and you're like, you know, you hear the roar. I thought, those are the best ones. I thought you were going to say taking a hit and the guy is laying on top of you and you look at him and say, that's all you got. <laughs> that's what I thought you were going to say. I gotta be careful with that. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> Depends on his time's left in the game. And by the way, talking about running, when's the last time you did a 40 yard dash? Uh, Never. Um, 2004. Yeah. 2004. What'd you run? Well, I think <laughs> there was one guy that had me at a 497, I think. The other ones were 502, 504, 506. I know. I, if I have to run 40 yards, we're not oh, we're in I trouble. Know. I, I, you know, if you can run 40 yards, the defense, where they at, right? It's going to take it forever. Um, your son. Oh, before we do that, can you say a play? Because most people think that y'all get in a huddle and say, hey, go down there and I'll throw it to you. <laughs> <laughs> right? They really do. <laughs> yeah. give, give us a, a long play and then explain it. A long play? Okay, let's see. Um, I don't know, a long play? It's been 14 years. Well, I know. I'm trying to think of a long any one. Any play, just any play. I'm yeah. thinking a long one from back then. We would say, uh, you know, um, swap, dual right, FN, fake taxi left, naked right, block, deep 702, bomb. So, just to, because, because what, see, right, right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, destroy the myth that we are dumb. Yeah. Like, you follow what I'm saying? Because some people, they think we're dumb. Right. They, so, we want to we wanna explain it. Just, the mind. <laughs> just give well, a See, and just like in the, in the very next system, that play is something else. You so, know, what happens when a new coach comes, new they coach change comes the whole language. That same play is split right, F short, fake taxi left, naked right. X-ray post or X-ray, you know, so it's all, and yeah. How many, how many plays would you have in a game? We probably have, I don't know, 100 plus in a game. 
I mean, that changes week to week. Some of them stay every week. Some plays stay every week, and then other plays are, are you know, are, are new wrinkles for that opponent. Okay. So when you go up to the huddle, just to, so we educate people so they know what looking at, you go up to the huddle, you look around, you see the defense, you change the play, can't change the play. How many times? Uh, it depends what game. You know, some, some games, if we're in a no huddle mode, it's getting changed quite a bit because we have the time. You know, we're up at the line, we've called the play. Oh, they did this. Oh, let's change it to that. Oh, no, they didn't do that. Let's change it to something else. So it could move. Uh, and then other times, you know, when you're in a groove, uh, and, and Wiz, Ken Wiz and our coordinator, we're on the same page a lot, but when he's really rolling, there's not a lot of changing. You know, it's, it's not because he didn't call the right play, but just he's in the groove and we're going. And those games, some games there's not many. Some games you're changing 40% of them. Okay, because I know that they may not have an opportunity to get this again. You call the play, you come to the huddle, change it twice just so they can hear what you say. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. We call it, so let's call, um, let's go Queen Right 50 slant in the huddle. Queen Right 50 slant on one. Ready? Break. Go up there. Oh, this doesn't look good. So, uh, what doesn't look good? He looks out, he knows where this, his guy's gonna go, and the defense is already sitting where they're gonna go. Basically, they're lined up to stop the play. So then we, I say, oh, easy, easy. Hey, let's go act five, act five. Flutie. Flutie's a play has been around a long time, named after Doug Flutie. I'd say Flutie. And then. And by the way, when he does that, we can change the play on defense. Yeah, so they may check out of that blitz. And then we switch, move around, and he sees us move around, and then you go. So then I could get to another play, or at that point, I may say, hey, reload, reload. And now we're going back to the first play. And then we go. Uh, we don't know what that means. We, we get the pencil last. <laughs> That's the best part. The offense gets the pencil last. Y'all can do a bunch of stuff. We, we're, we're in charge of when we snap that ball. And then the ball gets snapped, and then we and you. There's a lot going on. Stuff can change again while the play's happening. How many of y'all didn't know that? Y'all lying. You didn't know that. <laughs> your son. Tell us about your son. Yeah, my, so my oldest son's nine. His name's Gunner. Uh, which is my mom's maiden name, but if he can end up being a pretty good quarterback, that would be pretty fitting. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't why we named him that. Um, it was, gosh, it's been four years now. It was right before his fifth birthday. He, he was all ball, always wanted to play, all the time. Play, throw me passes, make me dive, play, 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 play. And he was, he was not wanting to as much. He was saying he was tired all the time. He's having to use the bathroom all the time. And so we, uh, and, and, my wife said, gosh, we need to just, let's just get him checked. When I pick him up, he doesn't, he seems thinner and, you know, and uh, of course, again, the mom's the heart of the, of the house and I'm the head of the house, but it was, you know, I'm, I'm more after like, you're fine, let's go, you know, let's go. And she's like, no, he doesn't feel good. So we took him in. Anyway, his blood sugar was like 700. And so he, he you know, he's, he has type 1 diabetes. And so we take him in, which is a, you know, not that I know all the ins and outs of it. It's an autoimmune disease. You know, your body attacks your own cells that produce insulin. So when you eat a, eat a carb, any carbs you eat, you know, our bodies, uh, you know, produce insulin that keep your blood sugar even. Well, his body wasn't making any, so his blood sugar's going up and up and up. So we took him in, and I just remember, you know, he's got all the tubes hooked up to him, and they're getting his blood sugar down and the whole thing. And, it, you know, and it's a, it, to this day, it's a lifelong uh, disease. You know, it's a lifelong uh, burden for him to carry. There is no cure at this point. So um, I remember going to Children's Hospital and, I, and uh, feeling just overwhelmed and upset. And I remember going home before he had come home. He was there a day or two and just bawling, crying, standing out in the backyard, uh, thinking, Gosh, what's, you know, we're going to have to prick his finger every time before we play catch. Or we're going to have to do this. How's he going to do this? You know, you, all these things are just running through my mind. And I was just thinking, this is like the end. This is the end. You know, like, uh, what are we going to do? I mean, it wasn't 48 hours later. We were leaving the hospital. And I was, by the grace of God, I was overwhelmingly thankful that we were taking him out of there. You know, and, and any of you that have lost a child or that have dealt with it, I know I'm not the only one. I'm just sharing my story with it. But there was children in there that I was passing by their rooms that they weren't leaving. You know, their moms and dad weren't taking them out of there. There were children being pushed out into wheelchairs that they weren't going to walk. And we were going home, and we're going to have to deal with, you know, shots and finger pricks, but we're, we're going to be fine. So I was overwhelmingly thankful, really by God's grace, because it, it, I, it, not by my own strength or my wife's own strength, and we look back 10 years ago, let's say, and think, you know, eight children 
one with diabetes. We got another one that's got some food allergies and things that we deal with. And it seems like we got to, I'm running for the hills, you know, like I can't do this. But God's grace meets us, has met us here. And um, he's nine now and he's, he's fine. He's great. But we, we to this day still pray for a miracle, pray for him to be healed if that's God's will. And if not, if that's his burden, you know, uh, to carry, um, it's taught us all a lot. It's taught us all a lot. I've, I've, our, our family has, has grown closer through that. What's his name? Gunner. Gunner? G, G-U-N-N-E-R. Let's all lift our hands up. Let's pray for Gunner right now. Amen? And by the way, is anybody else, anybody else, if you have a child with diabetes, raise your hand. Just wave your hand like that. Diabetes, just wave your hand. Boom. Anybody else? Diabetes? Okay, let's pray for all these kids with diabetes. Lord Jesus, you are the great physician. You heal. Uh, you heal uh, the blind and mute, the deaf, you raise the dead, you cast out demons, you spoke to the weather. We pray for all these children with diabetes. We pray for kids with cancer. We pray for people here with kids who are in ICU right now. We pray you heal them. We pray you show yourself strong on their behalf and that you, Jesus, would get the glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, you had a verse in there. I don't know if you wanted to read it at this point or at the end. It yeah, I, that. It's really appropriate now. Yeah. I, mean, I think with, with that, um, second, um, wait, second Corinthians chapter one. If you have a Bible, turn to Second Corinthians chapter one. And while he get, why he, why you go there, I want you to think about your relationship with God and the relationship God has with your burden. Because God doesn't want you to come to church or have a relationship with him where you're going to heaven and you learn a little information and then you deal with life on your own. He wants you to cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And he wants to shape and mold your life into his image through your good times and bad times. But there are some of you in here, you need to surrender your burdens to him. You need to acknowledge that that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with you. He wants to interact with all your stuff all the time. Am I, am I making sense? You say amen if you know what I'm talking about. And so, so I want you to be thinking about because in a few minutes you're going to have an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to cast my cares. You know, he talks about casting your cares on the, on, the, on the stage. I want to give my life to you. I want you to forgive me. I want you to fill me with the spirit of God. In a few minutes we're going to have the opportunity. Do you want to read that? Yeah, I will. And I think because it's through those burdens that, you know, through Gunner's burden that for our family has grown closer and stronger through that. You know, seeing his, the discipline he has to have, for those of you that raise your hand, that they can't just go grab a snack whenever they want, you know, and, and, and his sisters and all of us seeing that and how he handles it and how gracious he is about it has really been a good example for all of us. So this is uh, Second, Second Corinthians, verse 1. Let's start at 3. Let's go 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God of all encouragement who encourages us in our every affliction so that we may be able to encourage those who are in any affliction with the encouragement with which we ourselves are encouraged by God. For as Christ's sufferings overflow to us, so through Christ does our encouragement also overflow. If we are afflicted, it is for your encouragement and salvation. If we are encouraged, it is for your encouragement, which enables you to endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is firm, but we know that you share in the sufferings, you also share in the encouragement. Hmm. God has been doing something in your life, and when you got the invitation to come here, you said that there was something going on spiritually in your life that your wife, well, tell us about, tell them about that. Yeah, well, I just, you know, I, uh, you, get, you get comfortable. Uh, I speak at some men's conferences, and, and usually they're Catholic men's conferences, and um, but you get comfortable in your, in your faith, in your little bubble, and your little community, uh, family, friends that we have, and, um, you know, you don't branch out much, and we were, at, it was actually our 16th uh, wedding anniversary a few weeks ago, and, and uh, we were actually together when I got the email from Pastor Miles uh, inviting me to come, and, uh, and it was just, it was, I don't, it was, again, it goes back to that gut feeling, that Holy Spirit telling you, not audibly, but telling you, yeah, like, yeah, go. And, and it was really my wife right away. I said, hey, what do you think? You know, and she was like, well, yes, you have to, you have to go. And, and I felt the same way. And, um, you know, and it just so happens today in the Catholic Church, it's Trinity Sunday. You know, <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we were singing that song. And, um, you know, 
one of the great mysteries of our faith, right? I mean, it's unexplainable, mm-hmm. but awesome and so real and so uh, here uh, tonight. So I'm uh, thankful to, that I was able to share with you uh, in your worship tonight. It's been, uh, it's, 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 I always love two, twofold. I hope that, uh, that God has used me to, to touch one of you in, in y'all's journey and your faith journey. Uh, with Jesus, but also it always helps me. Always, when I leave here, all, always I go, man, I needed that fill up, you know. So thank you. You 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 are you are a down home country guy, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you listen to country? Yeah, last well, yeah. I don't listen to a ton of music. You, you don't listen. To, I mean, I do. Yeah, you don't country. have like Lil Wayne in your country. house. Country, nah. I, I was trying to figure out if you're a little Wayne kind of brother. Uh, yeah. Probably not. I hear plenty of it, though, in the locker room. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> How can we pray for you? Um, I think just uh, spiritual and physical protection uh, for me and my family. All ten of us would be, mm-hmm. I'd be grateful for that. Just to be clear, um, when you go to L.A., the... The guys who are on the team, like long like you, that that will never be your home. Never. This is your home. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I didn't realize it would get like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole, the whole time they were talking about leaving, talking about leaving, I literally, that ain't going to happen. I didn't even, I, like, I didn't even get it. I didn't even get, like, involved with it. I was like, that ain't going to happen, that ain't going to happen. But um, uh, I remember when, you know, you were a rookie, when I was coming down to the, sta- to the practice, I used to go to practice every week with the alumni, and we would um, give the player a game, player of the game award, and I would do a devotional for the team right after practice. Barney Schottenheim was like, Tell, talk to us. And I would tell a story and then he said, do us again, do it again. And, and that, you were a rookie and Drew Brees was still here. And, and so it's been a long time, you know. We've had Drew here last year, a year and a half ago he was up here. And, uh, you, know, he still, you know, he's a great, great dude. And, uh, great. He, he, but uh, he left and they, they, they kept you. Yeah. They kept you. I mean, Y'all, y'all, he did great when he was here, and Marty Schottenheimer, that, those are the good old days, and then we got kicked out after that, you know that, after yeah, Marty left, right. and that was really messed up, but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, we want to pray for y'all, because there's some of y'all out there that you won, uh, so we're going to pray for your spiritual thing, your spiritual growth, and your spiritual protection, uh, and that you would thrive and that, you know, no matter how many more years you play up there, that, you know, you retire down here. And come on back. And come on back. Amen. Um, there are some of y'all out there, you have two things. There's one of two things. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You know you're a sinner just like everybody else. And you know that Jesus died and rose from the dead for your sins. But it's not religion, organization. It's relationship that you want to give your life to him to establish relationship so he can guide you through your life. I mean, you just heard him say, listen, I, I have all the success in the world, but really it's my relationship with Christ and my faith that is the foundation because one day he will retire, one day he will get old, one day all this, and there will be a whole new team. We'll know none of those guys, and it's all, it all passes. And my coach who, who coached me here, he's dead, Don Coriel. A lot of y'all don't even know that name, but he is. Amen. Amen. But Don Coriel <laughs> was the man. <laughs> he invented the, the West Coast. He invented all that stuff we see today. And he's gone. And he was one of the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, and, and so time goes by, but, but the time on earth is this short. If you can imagine a rope going around the earth as 
the length of your existence, your time on earth is like that much to that rope. This is so quick. But your time in eternity is eternity. It never ends. So the rope keeps going around the earth like that. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to decide where you're going to spend it. It's up to you. Either you say, Christ, I would like you to forgive me. Or Christ, I don't want to have anything to do with you. So that's number one. Some of you are going to have, uh, make that decision today. And then, then there's some of y'all, you're struggling. You came here because, man, this is going to be a cool, Philip's going to be there, I'm going to feel good, but I got to go back out there and deal with my crap. Don't go out there by yourself. Cast your cares on him and say, Lord, I want to bring my burden to you. I want to face my fears to you. So I'm going to ask in a minute all y'all to bow your heads and close your eyes, and you're going to have an opportunity to do one or two things, to ask Christ to be your Savior or to pray with us, to say, Lord, I'm casting my burden on you, and then we want to pray for you. Amen? Before we do that, let's give him a big hand for coming here today. Amen. Amen. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, we pray for Philip. We pray that you would continue to reveal yourself to him and make yourself known to him in a very real and tangible way. We thank you for uh, all the football he's played and just being in our city for so long. We thank you for his family and his kids and his love for his kids. But we also pray that you draw him close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I, I want to do something. I don't really do this, but I, I don't want to interrupt my flow. But there was something that you wanted to end with that is more appropriate than now I begin thing. Can you tell that one story? I'm sorry. I don't, I don't want to. I want to make sure he has the opportunity to say this. Yeah, so... <clears throat> A few years ago, um, this phrase was given to me. It's a Latin phrase. I say it the Alabama way. Um, Nunc cepi. You, you can look it up, but N-U-N-C. C-O-E-P-I. He's got it on his shirt right there. Nunc cepi. And it means now I begin. And, but it's, it's that never ending again and again and again. And uh, we applied it as a football team. Um, you know, you hear one play at a time or finish. It was just a new way to hear that. Well, we got to begin again. Throw an interception, Nuke Cheppy. Throw a touchdown, Nuke Cheppy. It was that start again, begin again, wherever wherever you are. And it applies in your marriage. It applies uh, father, and your, father and mother and your children, you know, whether you're lost, a little impatient or not as attentive. Well, Nuke Cheppy. You know, start again right there, and, and certainly in our faith. You know, I think too many times we think we've uh, fallen too far from God or we're not worthy. And, and only by God's mercy and grace, uh, we, we aren't worthy. We're all sinners, but we are because of, of Jesus dying for us. So, but but that you begin again. You know, you, you know I always liken, you forgot your daily prayers today. You put them off. You didn't do it in the morning. You said you are going to get to it at lunch. You pushed it off then. It got to the nighttime, and you didn't do it. Well, Nuke Cheppy in the morning. Nuke. It's a, a new day. Nuke Cheppy. Nuke Cheppy. Everyone say Nuke, Nuke Cheppy. Cheppy. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray Nuke Cheppy. We're going to pray, now I begin. This moment is the first moment of the rest of your life. You cannot go back. This moment is the first moment of the rest of your life. Why can't you change the course of your life right now to say, Lord, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to surrender my burdens to you right now. Amen? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, we just, I just thank you for your faithfulness. And I thank you for your goodness. And I thank you for everybody listening and watching on all line and all the campuses. And there are so many people who want to start their life over. They either want to give their life to you for the first time or they want to cast their burdens on you and surrender themselves to you that you can walk with them through their pain. 
at a level they haven't done before. So if you would like to start over today, now I begin. I want you to pray this prayer with me to surrender yourself to Christ. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God, I want to begin all over right now. I believe Jesus loves me, that he died and rose from the dead, and that he has an incredible plan for my life. Jesus, I need you in my life. I have burdens I cannot carry on my own. I surrender my life to you. I acknowledge you as my Savior and my Lord. Fill me with the Spirit of God. Take over my life. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner. I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we wanna know, and we wanna email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we wanna send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.